we don't have it today, we have a substitute, Conrad Jameson, acting as the man in the street, and acting in many other capacities. I've uh, been introducing now Conrad to different places, so I've run out of kind of things to say that <laughs> you probably haven't heard before about Conrad. And I think you probably all know him anyway. That's right. Um, so all I want to say, by way of an introduction, a general introduction, place him in the context of this uh, meeting and my own preoccupation, is that to me, Conrad is, although I don't agree with him uh, more than maybe 72%, um, he's a very interesting, to me, touchstone, or I call him seeing eye dog, um, to see what's wrong with other things and to use as a spur. I mean, I think that Conrad, by taking very extreme positions on housing and, uh, and now public architecture, forces, at least forces me to clarify a lot of my own positions on how far one should accept uh, past uh, models, the vernacular, and so forth. So then Conrad is not here as a uh, defender of postmodernism. In fact, I imagine he's uh, quite comfortable here to say other things. Conrad. Thank you very much. I can return the compliment because I must say that I found this book of unusual quality, but also unusually stimulating. I don't say this is just one of these sort of offhand words when you can't think of anything else to say. Stimulating was a word I would use when I could just uh, put this, and I'm still thinking about this. I really, I was working on it last night, thinking about it this morning. In fact, thinking about it the last nine months, because I read it nine months ago, and I'm still not at all certain all the meanings that will come out of this book. I doubt very much whether they will be the meanings that Charles himself has indicated, but you'll see why in a moment. Yeah, I'm really short of space here, so I can just sort of get myself assembled. phrase indeed. Modern architecture died in St. Louis, Missouri on July 15th, 1972 at 3.32 p.m. or thereabouts when the infamous Pruitt Ego scheme or rather several of the slab blocks were given the final coup de grace by dynamite. Now, I feel very thankful for that or thereabouts not because uh, even, even though it's in brackets as it happens because I, I will be unshadowed for about a few minutes, or a few hours, or even a few weeks. But I wonder if one should be charitable about a few decades. Because what this assumes is that, really, that if something died, then something must have been born. Now, Charles is very cautious here. He doesn't say that uh, because one thing is dead, the other thing is not only born, but mature. And I think he says in, 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 a, in his Sunday Times piece coming out this week uh, that it's really uh, hardly 12 buildings that we can call upon to, to represent this new thing called postmodern. And uh, even these turn, tend to be uh, faulty in some respect or another. But at least in theory, and this is an important point, in theory there's no small things to be sniffed at. In theory we can see our way clear to this new thing called postmodern. Now, if this is so, it's about to be wished, theory is our guide, then really the long agony of modern architecture, this terrible alienation which architects feel with their public, the, the public feels even more with architects, at last this is at an end and we can now see our way forward. So here is a great hope indeed and you read this book with high hopes, we can see what the next thing will be. What definition can we use, then, for this thing called postmodern? We replace modern. Just before I started this, this lecture, um, Jeffrey Broadbent said to me, what, what is modern? I'm having enough trouble with what is postmodern. I think I'll leave what is modern for another lecture. But let's see what postmodern is. Well, there's several definitions. My wife asked uh, Bob Stern yesterday, and he said that was a very frank question. What is this postmodern? He says, bringing back the goodies. Was that his phrase, I think? Something like that. <laughs> I know what the goodies are, Venustas, or something like it. 
That's Bob Stern there, just a second. Um, good, I suppose, ornament, fun, delight, trim, something like that. definition will work. I'm not suggesting that Charles uses this, this one. I've just, I just heard it about, but this is what it's about. It sounds good that, you know, we've had all this sort of bare, bare bottom look, and now we're going to get something rather ornamental. But historically, this couldn't be right, because after all, this is, if not the dominant part of modern movement, uh, which is international style, at least it is the subdominant, and you can find the Mayan decoration of Frank Lloyd Wright, and you can find Philip Johnson making fun of the modern movement in the 30s, and building his little palisades at half the height that they should be, or one-tenth the height they should be, and putting them in his garden as a folly. You can find Cretan power stations, uh, and you can find supermarkets with Gothic filigree, all done in what no one in this room would ever deny is modern. Um, it's a part of the tradition. And what makes it modern, despite the historicist throwbacks, is the shock you get, the visual shock of seeing something you didn't expect. So if Venturi does an ordinary neo-colonial or colonial house, and you find that the columns are set to one side so that instead of the windows being in between, the windows are a little bit off-centered so that you can't quite see out of the window, that shock effect, we know, is modern because it's the shock to the sensibility which is fundamental. Um, and this is really part of the avant-garde aesthetic. And here, modern architecture is part of an avant-garde movement, adapting its, uh, its postures. Here, it's a posture of antagonism to public taste, to popular taste, by constantly shocking public, public taste, by showing you must see something in some original way, no matter how conventional it will be. And if you look at it this way, well, then, of course, this has been the dominant tradition, uh, and this is nothing is new here at all. So just think of the ways of shocking, and I've mentioned the, the, the technique of, 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 uh, of Venturi, but you can think of uh, Peter Smithson with his, uh, I forgot the name of the Lambsden House, is it? Um, the uh, one that looks, so, so, uh, Sugden House, that's right, the one that looks like a council house, except you look at it, and of course it's got a funny L-shaped window. Or you can take the uh, economist buildings with ribbed uh, outside, and you think, well, perhaps they have some sort of upholstering function there, you know, some, you know, some sort of rib cage, some sort of stanchion. But really, when you come to the, look at the bottom of the ribs, you find that they have been uh, clipped off, and they're there just for decorations as pilasters. That's a shock. That's an anti-convention playing onto an anti-convention, which is all part of the game of being modern. Um, again, this is really a rotation between two, two poles of the modern movement, the one, the dandy side, the other, the... Uh, and I use modern movement as part of the avant-garde movement here, incidentally, not just in architectural terms. The one pole being the dandy, the other pole being the bohemian, the one proletariat, the other aristocratic. They marry each other. There's often the same person playing different parts at different times of the day. Uh, but you can't really say that this is any change. Uh, one thinks of uh, Baudelaire's uh, quotation, which I can't actually remember, but uh, there's only two heroes in our time. One is the criminal, and the other is the dandy. That is a real avant-garde a proposition, who but the criminal and who but the dandy stands out against the mass. Incidentally, it's just this sort of saying you can see that why a critic like Poggioli, looking at the whole of the avant-garde across the arts, would always say that the alliance between the arts, the avant-garde arts, and politics on the left is a pseudo-relationship, an insincere relationship, possible up until the 1870s, impossible thereafter because of this hatred, this antagonism towards the mass. So the posturing is there, unmistakably so. Um, let's try another definition of postmodernism, and this is one that Charles does use. It's multivalence. I'm not sure this is a, a distinguishing characteristic, but it's certainly one which uh, comes up constantly. We've moved from univalence to multivalence. I think in much simpler language, because I'm really very anxious, you see why, as, as, as a traditionalist, or as uh, I see the AJ said, as I read this morning, a pre-modern, um, to hold on to uh, ordinary language as best I can, I would just say complexity. 
is against simplicity, but this strikes me as simply a rotation of fashion. And it, it obviously fashion here has some much deeper roots, as fashion often does, in, in our sensibility. So while Queen Anne, the, uh, sorry, the, the uh, Queen House, Queen's House at, uh, at, at uh, Greenwich, by Inigo Jones, would be univalent, very simple, hardly a projection, just the center portion projects slightly and a little bit of rustication on the ground floor. Very simple building, a building. you couldn't get many complexities there. Uh, as compared to, say, Blenheim with its two orders in very complicated counterpoint and masses playing against each other in a very complicated way. But that is really something like Wolfland with sculptural and, and, and painterly types of yin-yanging between styles or tastes. This is hardly something that you would call postmodern. Now, I think now we've had enough of plainness. And we're very glad. I see. I find I am glad that I go back and I can look at Blenheim in a way which I could not look at it ten years ago, because I'm rather bored with the plainer, earlier work, and I like this type of fugal complexity. It's more exciting. And I cannot look at the thinned out, uh, as Corb would say, the thinned out uh, tower blocks that he would have proposed upon New York, and think this is interesting. But it would be quite unfair to think that the modern masters couldn't be multivalent, and who would know this better than Charles himself, when he talks about that master of multivalence, the Corbusier. And uh, I mustn't hold the past against Charles, because I'd have to hold it against myself. I changed my position quite radically, something I'm not talking about on this particular lecture. Uh, but um, he's looking at the Unité, and he finds four criticisms, criticisms against it. Uh, one is that uh, Jane Jacobs condemned the shopping center for being unrealistically removed from the city. Louis Mumford criticized the long, narrow apartment units for being too thin. And Siegfried, Siegfried uh, Gideon faulted the internal streets for being dark corridors. And the popular pre uh, press attacked the whole idea of housing 1,600 people in a vast anonymous inhuman, uh, in a inhuman beehive. Now, he then tosses this aside and says, well, um, if a work has multiple determinants, it will allow plausible interpretations, some of which, although opposite, are equally valid. Um, and um, it's really not, you know, it's got good things and bad things, to put it in simple language. Fair enough. But, and then he, take another example, because you must, this multivalence is an abstract category. It's not, it doesn't belong to postmodernism. It's a way of looking at a work of art, and one which is very important. I'll come back to that. Here's another example from the same building. He looks at several characteristics of multivalence, or what I would call them complexity. Since this modification is another criterion of multivalence, it would be well to look at an, another small example of it in detail, the window seat. I don't know if you can see it here, but it's that sort of L-shaped seat that you find in the Unité. Perhaps you'll know it if you can't see it. Now, uh, actually, this L-shaped form is not so specifically a seat. It would be very difficult to sit on it, let me tell you. It's up to here. Um, as, um, as it is also a table, a structural stabilizer, an outdoor storage container, a place for children to hide under, and a part of the modular order which merges with several other visual contexts. From within the apartment, it becomes part of the view over the trees and landscape, while from the side, the L shape merges with the other geometric elements in white rhythmic drama sharpened by the strong sun. In short, there are eight intermediate contexts for the single form to work in, which is a very multivalent indeed. Or to put another way, there is at least eight links two different contexts. If each one of these links modifies the way the form is seen and used, it also modifies the surrounding area, making it richer in meaning. Now, this is an excellent example, as Charles says, of multivalence, and he puts it against uh, Liverpool, where there are a number of meanings, but they do not aggregate. They are simply aggregates of meaning. They do not interplay upon each other. And here is a work of art, and here is a bit of just lumpen uh, fakery. Um, on the, on, uh, uh, that's the Liverpool Cathedral. Now, if that is uh, multivalence, what is new? If we find this in Unité, and that's not even that's pre-1972. So that couldn't be the date at all for multivalence. Um, it's a way of looking at a work of art, which possibly has become more pronounced, but it could simply be a fashion, or it could be something else. You'll see that I think it represents something else. Let's try another definition, and I think this will be very popular. Unfortunately, you'll soon find that it doesn't work at all. It's a more participative approach to the client relationship. Let up. Now, this is what I hear from students when I say to, to, to students, really, you've got no business in housing, or if you have any business, it'll be very brief, just brief, of, just brief enough for you to uh, help get these pattern books together, and then you leave, like the queen bee who stung her, uh, leaves her sting. If this is 
what you can do, then this is going to be a very popular movement indeed, because I know what students like. They like to hear that they're going to be sort of barefoot doctors, that they will live as community architects, and that they will interpret people's needs, and that there will be, an, again, an intimate relationship between the client and the architect, and this great, horrible thing called alienation will now disappear. And if only you lived in Lambeth rather than lived in Chelsea and worked in Lambeth, that we could somehow get over this, these great problems, particularly in housing. Well, let's leave aside whether this is really a possible course of action. You notice that this definition doesn't work simply because it doesn't apply to some of the works that are chosen as, um, as postmodern. Uh, I take it that Bob Stern is postmodern, and uh, you would know one would say that his house, whatever it's called, with the eyebrows and uh, where it is today. Um, there it is. Is it? The eyebrow house? Yes, well, you don't see the eyebrow there. But uh, you've got the, the side view, whether in the front. Oh, yes, there it is. There it is. There it is. It was a Neo Palladian um, eyebrow. And um, this kind of work is in a long tradition, of course, going well before the modern movement, in the modern movement, be the Villa Savoy, Chiswick House, what have you. This small villa, the folly. But this is the type of work that requires certainly not even a client not less a client you know very well, but simply a patron, and these are very different animals indeed. Palmerston was a client. He overran what people decided upon, decided upon which style he wanted, and told the architect to get stuffed if he didn't do what he said. And he got his way. Now that's a client. Um, a patron is a person who says, now you are a clever fellow, and you must know what a work of art is, and I will provide the money. I think Artnet has a patron. He certainly doesn't have a client. Um, now, uh, that's not too uncommon. But, um, so that definition works, doesn't work because it doesn't simply apply to the cases in hand. But let's try some other ones and see if it works there as well. It's not a very effective notion of participation insofar as you can find examples of postmodernism that are participative. Uh, the famous example here, I, would, I take it, is uh, the, uh, whatever it is in Louvain, that, uh, in fact, I saw with Charles, the, I think it's the, the, uh, Medical, medical building in, in Louvain. I'm sure there's many pictures of that around there. Is that it? Yes. There we are. Um, I've been got at recently for not using pictures, you know, and I heard <laughs> that words are not enough. I have to find some pictures of even someone else's. Anyway, that would be an example of participation. The students do their own thing. Um, and um, uh, presumably they influence the work in some way, the work has influenced the work, as you can as you, there are photographs of it showing how on the side, on one side of the building, the work has started making it look like a tree, then it becomes this, then it becomes that, and they did their own thing, and if that's not participation, what is? Well, it is, but it's a far cry from the sort of thing that certainly the students I talk to are interested in, which is this overcoming of alienation, and even, I, you could even question its sincerity as to whether this is not a, simply another way of getting a very contrived effect. One has to be very cynical about this because in the main thrust of the modern movement, you find this constant exploitation of exceptional circumstances or exceptional causes in the name of some new effect. The usual thing is mass housing, we must have mass housing, and if you don't let us do it, we won't have it. And uh, if you say, as I talked to Martin Pauley, I remember he walked out of a meeting when I was rather critical of his garbage house, but you don't understand the housing crisis. But I wished he were there, but I could reply, perhaps I can reply now belatedly, but I wonder if he understands his own motive in using the garbage house to supply this housing crisis. It doesn't seem to fit the third world, it's where sites and services would be much more applicable, and goodness knows it doesn't fit our own world. Um, what is this thing called the garbage house that we must create animals to look like this? It's exploitive. And aren't we doing the same thing with participation once again, taking a good word and using it exploitively to suit our own ends, or to be a bit un more unpleasant about it, suiting the architects or your own ends. Um, it's not a very effective and not a very good form of participation. The example used is biker. I'm told this is, this is rather professional of me and rather unpleasant to point out that this is not a very good way of doing a survey or not a very good way of being a psychologist because that happens to be the way I make my living. But I wonder if it's really a question of one professional sniffing at another. Um, I did a study of Keele University many years ago, it seems to me now. And one of the things that struck me is that how 
the architect had been able to sanctify, to legitimate his own decisions by calling in what looked like a client. He talked to the people who were the head of the um, student union. And who else to represent the students? That's a fair client, is it not? And yet the building expressed all sorts of things that this, quote, client liked, but didn't understand what the mass of students wanted. And it was a marvelous harmony between the architect's own modernism and the student's own indifference to those people who didn't have the same social skills he had. It didn't matter to him that the stairway was wide open or that he had put uh, open plan upstairs, which was very intimidating to most of the students, or that he had put down, he had put uh, those people who were derisively called Christians, those people who were, had socially uh, limited skills, on the third floor where they could hold their little meetings about this, that, and the other. Well, he had put his own office next to the door, and when I asked him why it was there, he says, well, you, we had, once had a visit from the queen, you wouldn't want to go up three flights of stairs. Uh, uh, clients can be curious, animals and not always representative, must be very careful. But take perhaps the most famous now example of participation, which has been used to legitimate a form, and that's Baikar. And that's a very interesting animal. First place, there's two bikers, as you know. There's the biker wall, and then there's the fairly ordinary housing behind it. I did spend several days there, and uh, I had to be very careful when you talk to people about what they like or dislike about a place, because if you're not careful, you will get a reaction to quite extraneous things. For instance, people re respond to two things. One, they re respond to Parker Morris. They say it's a good house if they mean they have room. And they think that the architect gave him that amount of room, which happens to be a mistake. The other thing they respond to is what, what sociologists call relative deprivation. That is, it's a hell of a lot better than the roof they had, they didn't have with, over their head or the in-laws they had to live with, etc. And uh, this accounts for the fact that the highest score known for satisfaction is in high-rise flats in Glasgow, where 91% of the people said that they were satisfied. Now, possibly they were satisfied, or possibly they were satisfied not to be unhoused for the first time. So satisfaction is not the, the simple criteria that it's meant to be. But look at this biker war. When you actually try to blot out these extraneous factors, and I tried to do this only in a pilot, and I can't really say that anything authoritative here, they didn't like it at all. They thought it was bizarre. They were embarrassed and kept saying to me, well, don't judge the place by here. And when they liked the place, they were not talking about biker as created by an architect, but a biker, the place they grew up in. That's what they liked. They liked something which was not the architect to give, although it's give, the architect is given credit for giving it, that they were allowed to stay. The idea that the architect should be the person who dispenses this largesse is, a, is an obscenity. Um, that notion of participation is very phony because it's created something which is quite alien, and, it's, and as I've pointed out in Sunday Times piece, I was, had many coals in my head because of it. Uh, this is an old idea. It's a Baroque idea played with in the modern movement. Uh, of instead of using point blocks, you use a massive form, usually here in this case, uh, fairly adorned, but it's the massiveness that creates the effect. And if you can't do it in the same way you do the Louvre with uh, great uh, walkways and so forth, you will do it in another way here with funny brickwork. That is what that is about. Nobody asked for this. There is no relationship between client and architect here that you can fall back upon. And as for the buildings, yes, he does use fairly vernacular buildings. But you know, if he didn't do that and he hadn't bothered, it would be just as nice a house or even better. I noticed that when you ask criticisms of the place, they said, this wood. And the wood was not going to rot because it has been chemically treated. But wood there stood for prefabrication, symbolically. While what stood for trim in New Castle was stone. Now, using this wood in this arbitrary way and these funny little colors, this is alienation. The fact that he lived there for eight years meant nothing. And I, I became very suspicious when I talked to his, his colleague. I think his name was Lee. And I said, what, what's up now? And he said, well, we've discovered after our research, this is after eight years, after eight years, that the old people should be grouped and that they shouldn't be scattered. But I can remember I was working in the East End doing a job, and not because I'm clever, but it came out in the first interview that if they weren't going to live in their fam with their families, they'd rather be slightly grouped, at least, so that they could have some sort of mutual help. How is it it takes eight years to find this out? That's a very slow type of participation. Anyway, going on to a third possible definition, and now it's becoming much more interesting, and I think this is where Charles goes to town and scores very successfully. We're going to use a definition of postmodern as a way, way of controlling the communication for its, for its relevance, and what would be another word for its impact, that it actually has to communicate what is meant or what you want it to mean. 
Now this is an interesting way of looking at architecture and what an improvement it is, and I'll come back to that point. I find this a very fascinating critique, and look what it does to something like the international style. You can see that what was intended by the Corbes and the Mises, etc., was this absolute form, this absolute geometry, something that Boulet would have wanted maybe you know, nearly two centuries before. Um, a perception of true form as it is, a wiping away of ornament, a wiping away of everything that was extraneous except that pure thing that is called art. But what the, is it when you look at it semantically or when you look at it as Charles does as, uh, under the eyes of semiotics, it becomes simply a symbol of a grosser form of capitalism, an office block that now stands for everything that a younger generation of architects want to reject. It's at least recognizing that what the architect wants to do in terms of pure art is irrelevant to what is actually communicated. That's terrific. And look what he says again about Sydney, Opera House, a free form. And the quotations are really very good indeed. I don't know where he, exactly where he got them. I think they were students who were talking about it. Um, the free associations to this turtles making love, a traffic accident with no survivors, fish swallowing each other, and the happiest one of all, a scrum of nuns. Now, this way of going back, I was being a bit modest here because he himself is representing the common man, the consumer, in saying, well, how do people actually look at the building? What is the code that they use? And here we're a big, big step forward whether we mix that up uh, uh, forward in architecture or simply in the philosophy by which we might create the architecture, that question must remain. But as a theoretical push, that's, this is terrific. Now, um, the prescription I find very doubtful. The diagnosis, I think, is uh, not only honorable, but a way forward and possibly the way forward. At the best, this strikes me as a revivalism of a fairly um, dishonorable sort, it strikes me as a way of playing hanky-panky with a tradition without really ever respecting it. Um, this is, uh, you, it, there's no real attempt to say, what is my tradition? You know, tradition is not something you can just take a little bit from Japan and a little bit from the uh, Egypt and a little bit here and there. That's not what tradition is at all. Uh, Cheston has a quotation, I can't remember, something about, uh, you know, the man who can travel everywhere but can't really live in his own street. Um, this is a tradition. A traditionalist is a person who knows that he doesn't really have this privilege of jumping about as freely as he might like. He has to deal with the materials at hand. That freedom could be a very dangerous freedom indeed. But at the worst, this really becomes, to my mind, a glorification of hodgepodge. And I think this University of Levin is a good example. But the words used here, I think Charles is definitely stepping out outside of his, his, his historian's role and now talking as a moralist. Some of the words I find very disturbing. This, he's talking about the building which you will know from here. Now I would say, if I may use the right word, a sign, uh, what the postmodernism is. His Nibon Khan makes use of gigantic super graphics optical patterns, written signs, and combines these commercial codes with a geometric discipline and a volumetric expression more common in the high game of serious architecture. This, again, there is, there's a very significant phrase here. He's combining something with high architecture, avant-garde architecture as it happens. Architect, architecture, and commercial motifs can be combined without compromising either code. Is that true? All right. In fact, their mutual confrontation is a positive gain for both sides. The resultant hybrid, and I would hope you can hear the italics, this hybrid between this avant-garde art and these popular bits and pieces, um, like all inclusive architecture, is not easily subverted by an ironic attack, an unsympathetic viewpoint, because it balances and reconciles opposed meanings. Instead of gaining a tenuous integration by denial, by excluding inharmonious meanings in search of consistency, this inclusive architecture absorbs conflicting codes in an attempt to create a difficult whole. This is a very happy thought for those people who think they will have to give up nothing but some, include something else. It's a great sort of Hegelian whirlwind growing up here in which we can sort of take from the past, put it all into the present, and put avant-garde in, and put vernacular in, and put uh, Las Vegas in, you name it, a bit of Palladian this and that, you name it, we can put it all in. Great hope is here. 
Let's try another example. This one is going back to the Louvain again. There are pitched roofs here which tumble about the roofscape of an amog, am, amoeboid, I think that's the word, amoeboid community building, other popular signs such as trellis work, greenhouse sheds and primitive figurative sculpture punctuate the main blob of the scheme. One has to apply the new architectural terms to these units, perhaps hills is a better word. The syncopation of various materials over the surface of these blob hills can only be described as rich and riotous, tumultuous, tumultuous in the detail and violent in the whole, and yet still very personal and small scales. It is a kind of language very appropriate for student life. I hope you accept that. And desires, at least some desires. The, I notice that many of the great thoughts are put here in brackets. Uh, it says, and some desires. Well, possibly it's, it's apropos to student life, and possibly it isn't. But no one would call this a serious view of a tradition. This is an eclecticism which could apologize for almost anything you wanted to do and gives, if anything, a much freer hand to the architect despite the, the fact that he now wants to communicate. By being so eclectic in his communication, by taking from here, yon, and everywhere, is he really bothered about this consumer after all? Now, again, I want to come back to what we have gained here because if postmodernism does nothing else, and I think this is what actually will happen if it just simply sifts down to a new theory of architecture, which is yet to arrive, then is, this is a uh, historic occasion and something uh, really to look forward to. At last, we have got rid of this functionalist rhetoric. We don't have to look at this building anymore in this dreadful functionalist way. We now have a way of, of speaking about architecture which is viable. Um, this Functionist thing, not only uh, was it uh, uh, insincere in so many cases, and that I put a parenthesis here, the insincerity, I mean, just using anything that could be said to be some, uh, functionist in order to get a given effect. But it was a way of not thinking, really, about what the function is likely to be. I mean, the AIA awards for uh, Purit Igu is again repeated uh, this year is symbolically in the award for the, uh, uh, what's the name of the building in Boston, the Hancock Building in Boston. Dysfunctional it might be, but elegant. And yet the rhetoric is functionless. This discrepancy between the rhetoric used and the actual thinking has made it very difficult for architects to think about their work. And I can tell you, I, say, I speak with feeling, it made it very difficult for them to understand what a critic might be saying. But they are talking about the people's needs. They are talking about consumers. I've had, was it Derek Walker saying, but we love our work and we care about people. Yes, but you're refracting it through a rhetoric which makes it very difficult to understand how people use buildings or how they perceive it. At least we have a language for talking about buildings. And we're talking about communications, and that's, again, a step forward. But I still don't think this gives us postmodern architecture. A long way from it. What Something has happened, and I don't think that uh, Bob Stern's building or this University of Louvain is the same thing we had before. It's not a simple matter of plus change, uh, the plus in mem shows. There has something, something has happened. And I think I know what it is. Instead of having modern architecture, we now have super modern architecture. And I mean that quite seriously. We have an intensification of the modern movement, which has now been cleansed of some of its extraneous elements, of which the most extraneous was functionalism. It came in very late, and good riddance to it, because it was quite inappropriate and very confusing. But be very careful about the terminology. If you talk about Victor Hugo and you say he's a romantic, and you talk about Mallarmé and you say he's a symbolist, do you mean that different people belonging to a different movement? No, not at all. What you're saying is that Mallarmé is more romantic than Hugo. He's made the movement more intense. He's used a, a more hermetic form. And we use this because we need name, names. We need tags. This is not, this is human, nothing wrong with it. We put the word symbolist, but to say one is symbolist and one is romantic, oh no, no, you, you really confuse the whole issue. In the same way to say that this is, that uh, Bob's work is postmodern, no, this is confusing. It's more modern. I don't know if you would accept that, that point. Uh, I, wasn't your friend, who was the person who said, you, you quoted him, and he said, I am the first modern architect? Peter Eisenman. Yes, Peter Eisenman. I can understand what he says, and uh, in a sense, he's right. 
maybe not the first, the second, or the third, but the idea that it's just beginning is a thought that uh, well, leaves me shaking, but I just leave it for you to, to, to consider. Uh, because when you look at the modern movement and look at the characterizing, the, the things that characterize it, and say, are these things changed? You find that for the most part, far from being changed, they've in fact intensified. Now, I look at this from without, as Charles said, but uh, it's not uh, so without that you can't understand what I'm saying or assume, nor should you simply assume that it's hostile. I'm looking at it as a set of sociological categories because I look at the modern movement as an unusual movement in the arts in that it justifies a profession's activities. And in saying this, I am not, as some people imagine, hostile to a profession. This is ridiculous. I'm simply using sociological categories to try to understand something uh, which I can't understand unless these categories are used. And I say, well, what are uh, the, the needs that are served by an occupational ideology there? The needs are make work and make power. You don't actually succeed, I might add, and the claim is uh, very weak uh, in terms of the performance. Uh, and it varies considerably, incidentally, between America and Britain. I find a great deal of difficulty uh, talking to Americans about this because they see that much less of their built environment is actually architect controlled. And so when you talk to start talking about an occupational ideology staking a claim to control this environment, they say, well, we don't control it. Yes, I know you don't. But that doesn't mean that the claim isn't there. The uh, British architect, the British student, knows a little bit better because he knows that the influence has been terrific, spasmodic, of course, and uh, chewed up, and uh, uh, Spaghetti Junction isn't every everybody's dream. Uh, but he knows that this power has been there. And he knows that housing, public housing, has been under, in architects' hands and planning uh, in the hands of planners who were former architects. This is a, um, not something that, that truth will not escape him. But let's look at what modernism is and see if it's actually changed in postmodernism. And I use these sociological categories purposely here and just look at one by one. The first and most important characteristic is the, and this is to me the sociological defining characteristic, is the territory claimed by a profession, and the territory claimed by modern architecture, and no less claimed by, quote, postmodern architecture, or what I would call supermodern architecture, 